So, hello, London Gophers. You know, great turnout here on a, such a beautiful evening. Shows commitment, or maybe shows people like a pizza here. So, my name's Amnon, spelled with um, uh, lowercase uh, a. Anybody know why? Because I'm not exported. Uh, all right, sorry about that. I won't have, uh, there won't be too many jokes here, I promise. Well, actually, one more joke. There's uh, one joke here, um, which is not actually funny, and it's not actually uh, relevant to talk, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's the only joke I know. And the joke is, there was once a policeman saw a guy crawling around on the floor underneath a street lamp. And he asked him, Mr, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for my keys. And he said, where do you, lo where do you lose your keys? He said, I've got no idea. So why are you looking under the street lamp? He said, because the light here is good. So that uh, may be, that, that, I can't hear people falling off their chairs laughing or their beanbags laughing, but uh, there's a bit of relevance because what is our lamp? Um, and our lamp is um, the Go Microbench uh, um, framework. Um, 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 anybody here use it? So there's a few, quite a few people use it, and really it has two uses. One is if you are actually developing the Go compiler and you're trying to get better, you know, um, increase the performance, have better and better instruction selection, GoBench is a great tool. And other is it's useful for uh, writing blog posts and uh, preparing talks in forms like, like this. But for actually optimizing your code, for actually making your code go faster, it's uh, extremely misleading. So in this sort of talk, I'm going to uh, try to burst a couple of uh, myths, the, the, the myth that numbers do not lie, they do lie all the time, I'll show why. That nanoseconds matter, that faster means faster, no that's not a, a Brexit joke. And that large programs are like small ones, but more so. So the idea that you can take benchmarks of a component part of your programs, of the hotspots of your programs, and if you speed them up, then your whole program will, um, will end up running faster. So firstly, do nanoseconds uh, um, matter? And the answer is, um, uh, uh, you know, the answer is Go is usually fast enough. So, I mean, I've come from the Python world, you know, you're moving to Go, you get a speed up of uh, an order of magnitude, sometimes two orders of magnitude. And the execution of a code, the execution of instru instructions normally isn't, uh, isn't a problem when it comes to performance. So latencies of a real pro program that, um, is dominated by network delays, queuing, database access, lock contention, garbage collection, cache misses, and all these factors dwarf the um, um, actual execution of, um, of, um, of the instructions. So fast instructions don't necessarily mean that your program is going to execute faster. It often means that the uh, CPU is going to spend more time in stall cycles, sitting around, waiting for data to arrive, rather than actually executing code. Um, so I don't know, has anybody tried to execute, uh, try to optimize some code? They get the code, to, the actual function to go faster, and, um, but the overall program ends up executing at the same time. So there's a few, a few hands, one here as well. And, um, you know, I'm going to explore the reason a bit. So, um, over many, many years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, uh, memory and um, um, processes you know, were fairly evenly matched. And over time, processes have got faster. Moore's law said processes will double in speed every year and a half, every two years. Memory has also got faster, but at a much slower pace. That, uh, it's doubled in performance every, um, every, every decade. It's got much larger, but uh, the speed is still, uh, is still the same. So you get um, a massive bottleneck in terms of enormous processing power, but an enormous difficulty in shoveling the data into our processors fast enough. So our chip designers have... Uh, so to try to alleviate this problem by building caches inside, into our processors. So rather than accessing memory directly, they access via a cache, and the cache keeps a copy of the data you've just accessed. So next time you want the same bit of data, um, 
the data's already there. You don't have to go all the way out to memory. Um, uh, so, that, you know, so that saves a lot of time if the data's already in the cache. And for the data to already be in the cache, you need either um, temporal locality or spatial locality. Temporal locality is when you're using the data and then soon afterwards you're using the same data again. And spatial locality is you use some data and then soon after you use data which is next to it or, near, or nearby it. In those cases, the data will already be in a cache. If you're pointer chasing, um, if, your date, if your access patterns are fairly random, if you're going through random um, elements of a heap uh, po uh, chasing pointers, then um, you're going to have cache misses, your data is not going to be in a cache, um, your processor is going to spend all its time stalled waiting for this data to arrive. Now there's one article that uh, Jeff Dean, a Google engineer, wrote about a decade ago uh, which is numbers all programmers should know. And these numbers are really worth, um, they're slightly out of date, but the orders of magnitude are right. And these numbers are worth consigning to engraving on your soul. So uh, the number which isn't at the top is um, instruction execution. If you've got a three gigahertz processor, you can, in theory, in each uh, core, be executing um, um, three instructions per, uh, per nanosecond. In the modern core, you'd have eight, you can have 18, you can have 28 cores. So you can do a lot of um, instructions in a nanosecond. By comparison, half a na nanosecond, I'll go back to the previous slide, because I mentioned, uh, I'm going the wrong way, um, I mentioned that you have uh, caches, but also you have different levels of caches. So you've got extremely fast, but small level one cache. So le le level one cache is about 16 kilobytes for data, 16 kilobytes for instruction. Then you've got level two cache, which is bigger but slower. So you get, um, it's about 256K uh, uh, of memory in the sort of current processors, in the Skylakes, uh, which are coming out now, they're about a megabyte. And then you have level three cache, which is slower still, but much bigger, and shared between, uh, between the cores. So each, um, each uh, level of cache gives you a different trade-off. Um, you know, having, um, um, you know, each um, successive layer gives you um, slower access, but a higher proportion of actually getting a cache miss. So um, let's go back to Jeff Dean's uh, um, great numbers. Um, ah, I'm running out of time. Uh, so the important numbers here are the cache misses, level two cache, seven nanoseconds, that's about 30 instructions um, and a memory access, where's it gone, is around here, 100 now seconds. That's a few hundred ac instruction executions. Um, so making sure that you're using data which is in the cache, that your pr um, algorithms are cache friendly, that your data structures are cache friendly is, uh, is really important. Now the problem with our micro benchmarks and the reason that I said the benchmarks lie are because they execute your small bit of code many, many times in order to get an accurate reading. So that means the caches will be hot. That means that all your data will probably fit in the L1 cache. So the latency effects which dominate the execution time of your program are actually factored out of your, of your benchmark. Um, so you can have code which executes extremely fast in your benchmark, but in the context of a real program using real data, the performance is, uh, is far worse. Um, how can you see this? Um, yeah. How can I make the slide uh, move? Let's, wrong way? Ah, that's not good. Any, how do I get my uh, slides back? Yeah, all right. Normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. So I'll just talk over here in the meantime. So you can, um, the processors have nowadays performance counters, which count, you increment every time you get a cache miss, every time you get a pipeline stall for one reason or another. And you can actually see these performance counters using various tools like Intel's VTune, like the Linux kernel's perf uh, tool, and like OProfile. Um, yeah, if we just... Uh, 
we just refresh. We're nearly there. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, great, great. So I'll fast forward ahead. Um, so that's the problem with micro benchmarks. Now, this is a Go meetup, so we're, going to to, we're talking about Go. I'm supposed to be talking about Go. So how can Go help us with this? How can Go help us make code which is cache friendly? So the first feature of Go which is really useful is embedding. So the idea that you can take a structure and rather than have it full of references to other structures, those other structures can be embedded inside your, your structure. The data of them can be physically located within the memory of your structure, which means if you're accessing the, um, the, that data, the data will, um, um, you're accessing the structure, those substructures, those uh, enclosed structures will already be in your caches. Um, so that's one uh, useful feature. It can work against you because it can mean your data is too big to fit in the cache. Um, but it's often useful. The second feature which is really useful is slices, which is one of Go's generic uh, data structures, few generic data structures, but extremely useful because your data is stored in the order that it is, it is traversed. Um, and when you're traversing, um, you know, when the cache detects that you're grabbing some data, then you're grabbing the next bit of data, then you're grabbing the next bit of data, and there's a constant increment in your addresses, then it will uh, realize that's a pattern and it will start prefetching the data. And that prefetching means by the time you go to access that data, it will probably have been prefetched into the cache for you. So that can be a massive help. And then size data structures also mean smaller data, more likely to fit, fit in the cache. So a very short example, computer science 101, first year course in, in um, data structures and algorithms. Uh, friendly linked list, which we all know, a terrible data structure, and uh, then um, a very simple noddy iterator which iterates um, on our pointers and adds up the elements, uh, elements of the list. And then under here, I don't know if you can see it, but um, in an obvious Go, uh, typical Go um, equivalent, where you have a slice of integers rather than a linked list, and you just range across your slice in order to add the elements. So the question is, which one will be faster? Um, who thinks the top one will be faster? No one. And who thinks the bottom one will be faster? Everyone. So everyone's right. And then the question is, how much faster will the bottom one, uh, will the bottom one be? Who thinks it will be uh, twice as fast? And who thinks it will be 10 times as fast? And who thinks it's going to be um, uh, 40 times as fast? So I mean, the answer is you're all right. Actually, and it depends, um, uh, you know, on the size of the data. But the reason linked list is evil is what you know. You're following pointers around, and these pointers are going around in random elements, random locations of memory. So it re defeats. The, it's a worst possible thing in terms of a cache being able to help you. Basically, every access is potentially a cache miss. So I said benchmarks don't lie, but that applies to all benchmarks apart from my own benchmark, because I write a benchmark, it tells the truth. So uh, we can see the top, one, top uh, ones here of the vector version, and the bottom ones of uh, a linked list version. Now, if I put it in a table, you can see the sliced one has quite a nice behavior. It goes from you know, 100 elements, it's um, 80 nanoseconds, 800, 8,000, 80,000. You multiply the number of elements by 10, the time it takes to sum them all up goes up by 10. You've got very nice linear behavior. Now, you look at the linked list. It's actually similar behavior, similar time, when you've got a short list. When you've got a short list, it's all in level one cache. 12 nanoseconds, 15 nanoseconds, 3 nanoseconds difference. It's irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You get a bigger um, data set. Then it starts, instead of going up by a factor of 10, it goes up by a factor of uh, you know, 15, a factor of 30. Um, now, this goes up by a factor of 10. This actually is basically OK until here. 
Any ideas why it's basically okay until this point? And then it sort of starts shooting up into the... Uh, yes, cache misses. So if you go up to here, you've got 1,000 elements. Each element is 16 bytes, um, 160K of memory. It fits in your... Um, so, no, so... It's 16K fits in your layer one cache. So this is basically okay. And then from, from here onwards, you're getting, so this is three, you know, twice uh, st slower, twice and a half slower. Now it's seven times slower, now it's 30 times slower. And the reason is, when you go up to here, it's, actually, it's too big to fit in your layer two cache. So um, you know, it's going to the level three cache. And I haven't extended this to, you know, to fill up a level three cache and to go into main memory. But you can see actually pathologically bad behavior for the linked list type implementation when, um, uh, um, you know, when the data is big. And we care when the data is big. When the data is small, things are going to execute blind, blindingly fast anyway. So I think I've more or less run out of uh, time. Some useful resources, Dave Cheney's blog, um, Wikichip's great explanations of microarchitectures. Ehrlich Drepper wrote a great blog post, um, What Every Programmer Should Know About Memory, which I think only 1% of programmers probably know, a quarter of the stuff which is in the, the um, blog. Detailed stuff uh, worth, stu worth studying. So conclusion, when it comes to optimizing, the first law of optimization is don't do it yet, which is a very good law. Write code which is simple, write code which is clear. Um, that, that's the most important thing. The second thing is optimize your data layout rather than your code. Think about locality of reference. Th think about how the data is going to be accessed. Um, thirdly, the allocations do matter. And the data structures I was talking about, the slice and the question of um, the embedding helps reduce the number of allocations and reduce the pressure on your garbage collector. Um, use embedding, slices are your friend, and don't spend all your time looking under the lamp. Thank you very much.